Hello and welcome. My name is Wes Ward from Govern With. Thank you so much for your attendance today for the last cyber webinar in our series for 2023 on how boards can manage through a cyber attack. Obviously, in the last two webinars, we've really spoken about the issues, the problems, and how to prevent a cyber attack and what can be done at board level, what can be done at the executive level to make sure that you can protect yourself and pick that low hanging fruit that we talk about, talked about last month, which is really important. But today is super exciting and uh, the crescendo in this cyber series, because we're going to talk about what not many people get to talk about, mainly because people don't want to talk about that they were hacked, that they were compromised and the negative impacts that that can happen. But as we know, and what we've learned is it will happen. So what better than to get Australian, a global expert who does this for day-to-day -day business. David is from Solar Security. You met him on the previous webinar. I know we have a lot of new registrants today, so we welcome you all. So I'm going to walk through and just talk about our experts today and a little bit of background about David. Of course, my name is Wes Ward from Govern With. I'm the intensely curious governance host of these webinars. And of course, my boss, mentor and guru in governance is Fee Mercer. She's the founder of Govern With. And of course, we've got the cyber guru and security expert, David Ruddock, who helped us out last month. But we're really going to deep dive into the nitty gritty today, which is super exciting. And I just cannot wait for this, David. David, to that point, let's have a little brief background about your skills, your expertise and experience in this sector, just to provide a frame for everyone on the call, just to remind them from last month, or if they're new today, let's hear a little bit about you and a little bit about Solus and CFC Security. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Wes. And thanks, Fee. I'm really excited about today's. I think it's going to really round out or bookend the journey that you've been taking everyone on. So I started a business called Insane Technologies 23 years ago. It was acquired by CFC, who are a global insurer, who particularly pay attention to emerging risks. And they're one of the first that got into cyber insurance. My business is now part of a global business. CFC has, I think, 700, 750 employees globally. Solus, which is the cybersecurity firm, functions as both CFC response, which is the incident response team for CFC insureds, and Solus security for SMBs and SMEs to help them understand their risk, provide them with proactive cybersecurity solutions, and also in their time of need, help them with cyber incident response services. Over the last, I've forgotten how many years now, we've done thousands of cyber incidents. We see firsthand what causes cyber incidents. We see the good outcomes, the bad outcomes. And today in particular, we're going to talk about that, that what happens when an incident actually occurs, which is probably the most exciting part of my job. Absolutely. And that's why we bring the big guns to the table. So thank you for that introduction, David. Now, Fee, I know you said I don't want to talk about myself, but there are new people on the call today who may not know you. In 30 seconds, tell us a little bit about your background, because I know yeah, you were from the health sector and you were a governance consultant before you created Govern With. Your time to shine. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. So welcome, everybody. And bottom line, I just have an absolute passion for supporting boards to be high functioning because Wes, with my background in health, running a small rural health service, being a nurse, I just fundamentally understand that good governance basically does support and help build successful communities. And that's my passion. And what we're finding is right now, the risks around having good governance are really changing. And that's why we're talking about cyber and those sorts of things right now. Thank you, Fee. All right. Let's quickly start to roll into where just want to reiterate the point. This has been the, the theme for the last three webinars that cyber is not an IT issue at all. It is a board responsibility and it's evolving by the day. David's going to explain a little bit further about that later in the show that this threat is ever growing and multiplying. It's not a case of it's static and we can just put it in the corner. But if you haven't heard it already, I verbatim will say cybersecurity 
is a board responsibility. And we know this in the data fee. We do wheel this chart out from time to time for the new people amongst us or the ones that didn't quite grasp the significance of this data last time we showed it. Let's talk to this director data from the Govern With platform. So where's what this data shows is that actually directors lack the capability around cyber, which of course is being identified as one of the top risks, to firstly ask the right questions, secondly make well-informed decisions. And basically what that means for boards is to address this, we either recruit directors with those skills or we develop the directors we have or we do both. Absolutely. And of course, it has a disproportionate impact out of all the risks. And we've just managed to list five here. We rate that incredibly high level of impact because it literally can switch the lights out overnight. So let's talk about today's agenda. I'm really excited about this. We're first going to kick off about the board responsibility, touch a little bit about director liability, but not too much. But we're certainly going to take the governance high road to begin with before we really get into the nitty gritty attack discovery, cyber attack workflow, what's good, what's bad, and some stories from the coalface. Because as of course, we've got a global expert here who has eyes on the ground with his partners overseas as well. He sees every case on a daily basis. So these case studies are going to be really interesting. And I look forward to talking about that and working through how the negotiations with cyber criminals work out, David. So uh, very much look forward to that. But before we get started, I'd like just to shine a light over to you, Fee, about the board's risk around cyber, the implications for not getting this right and not taking it seriously. Wes, over the last few series, we've actually seen and heard some great examples of the immediate disruption to your core business. For example, we've heard about New South Wales grammar. They literally couldn't open the gates of their school when they had their cyber attack. And David, you've talked to us about clinical services that literally had to stop surgery immediately and could no longer administer scripts for really important drugs. So what this means, Wes, is how long can you actually last with your core business not operating? In other words, not doing what you do. And financial risk. First of all, there's the ransom costs. And secondly, there's those massive ongoing costs. So what this means is what are our costs now, right in the middle of the cyber attack, and what are the cleanup costs? And we have a really good example this week of Medibank being told by APRA, put aside $250 million. And reputation. Basically, we are the custodians in health of the most valuable data on the dark web right now. Of course, other services as well, such as schools, but health, we have that number one data. So what does this mean to us? Basically, what it means is loss of trust. And loss of trust for us means we can't attract staff. We might even lose the staff we have. And we certainly can't grow our market share in the future if people don't trust us with their data. And you only have to look at what's happening to Optus right now. They're losing all their customers to Telstra. And last but certainly not least, Wes, is culture. The board's job is to lead on culture, and there is a culture that relates to cyber. And our directors need to be curious and well-informed because what this means is, right back to where we started, they actually need to be able to ask the right questions, which leads to well-informed decisions. Thank you for that. That is an excellent definition of what's going on at board level to consider every time you meet. And this is why we're doing what we're doing. So now we're going to switch gears over to you, David, and really start to get into the nitty gritty of what things look like. We're going to start the workflows, what the processes look like across a range of different angles. But I'll kick this slide off 
around a ransomware attack with you. Yeah, for sure, Wes. And so one of the most common attacks we see is ransomware. There are a couple of others, but this is the one that typically ends up in in the media the most. It's the one that we hear about. And it's the one that tends to cause that show-stopping business interrupting event. Um, And what we know from doing the investigations, from understanding the various what we call threat actors, is that when the threat actor gains access to an environment, they will work out what that organization is. They'll work out if it's healthcare, they'll work out if it's an aged care, if it's a, a financial institute or whatever. They escalate their access. So they get essentially admin god access out of the system and they'll delete the backups. And we often see access to the environments that they've gained access to sold on the dark web. So the person who gets into the environment, we call the initial access broker, they will then go sell that access on the dark web. And typically it'll be a threat actor group, which is a criminal organization group who are best served to get the most out of that type of organization who buy access. And then once they buy access, they get into the environment and then they encrypt the all the data in the environment and make a ransom demand. And we, that that has been the typical ransomware playbook up until very recently and then if you want to go to the next slide Wes and we'll talk about where they've gone from there now because of the fact that a lot of businesses got a lot better at their backups they're no longer having USB hard drives attached to things or taking things home on on sticks or just not having backup systems at all we've moved to an environment where more and more businesses are backing up to a segmented systems or cloud or whatever, but it can't be deleted as easy. So the threat actors had to evolve. And like any good business, they look for new ways to to make money out of their customers. And they said, okay, if we can't hold them to ransom for just getting their data back, why don't we take a copy of it? And we call this double extortion. So they'll take a copy of your data and they'll basically say, look, pay us or we're going to publish the data we stole on the dark web. We see a lot of particularly professional service organizations, things like law firms, because of client confidentiality, they're very keen to pay the threat actor. But again, you're paying a a criminal on the assumption they're going to delete the data. And we don't have proof that they do, but we don't have proof that they don't. The next one is that they'll say, pay us or we'll start contacting your high profile clients, investors and partners. And that's triple extortion. We see that quite often with places like hotels or anywhere where sort of affluent or very popular people go and the threat that will literally start contacting clients and harassing them with a view that the client is going to turn around and go, we don't want our clients being harassed, we'll pay the ransom. And the final one we call quadruple extortion is essentially pay us or we're going to start attack against your services to take them offline. And we're talking about things like e-commerce platforms or any sort of online platform, whether it's an online booking system or whatever, that taking that offline is business interruption as well. So the threat actor will do that to try and coerce the business into paying. Can that also apply to third-party softwares that people on the call today, they may be using like Xero, for example, or a HR software or some sort of payment provider for suppliers, if that service, that can cripple it, even though it wasn't their issue at the time. 100%. We see cloud services being attacked all the time. There was a really big incident, I think it was last year, a payroll system that's used by government and, and a lot of large organizations was taken offline and that impacted all of those businesses that leveraged it. It also means that as businesses are thinking about which platforms they're going to use, they also need to think about, we are going to talk about incident response plans and what have you, but if that platform goes offline, because the cloud's this great thing that we can subscribe to, but if it does go offline, how does my business function and what's the impact? So yeah, really great question. I like to try and put some up from time to time, David. I do have another one out of these four scenarios from level one, two, three, and four. In your experience, what proportion tends to evolve out there in reality in the marketplace? Is it normally just a a straight up encrypt, here's the access 60% of the times, or is it moving up to that double or triple level? It's more so the double level we're finding because 
the threat actors know that a lot of environments will have backups that they can't see, for example. So they really want to hedge their bets. It's the triple and quadruple, uh, very specific industries that they'll target. Yeah, such as healthcare. Yeah. As we've seen in the previous data. So when we talk about a governance perspective, I'll start with you, Fee, and then bring you in, David. These now let's talk about some of the things you've got to consider from a cyber point of view once you're in the middle of it. Because Michael Perrin has been very clear two months ago that you will be attacked. And it will be a question of how many times and how much it's going to cost each time that incident occurs. So if you assume you're going to be attacked, what are we doing to consider at the boardroom table fee? What are we going to do and how are we going to go about it? With what this means is at the boardroom table, there should have been a discussion about this prior. And that relates very much to the board's risk appetite. That relates to what is our appetite and understanding that because in crisis, you don't have time to think about this again. And the sorts of questions that they should be asking is what is our policy? Are we think about it at the time and we'll weigh it up or are we a we do not pay terrorists organization and the other thing that boards need to know is this is not something where we as a board can ring the IT department with the greatest respect to the IT department this is where they don't know what to do isn't it David yeah 100 percent yeah it unfortunately quite often results in the IT department doing what they think is the best thing and it ending up in a very bad situation. They're actually not equipped. But at the board, we should be equipped and we should have had these scenario discussions prior. And, uh, and also we need to know one of our risk, the, an important part of our risk matrix is how long can we last? Isn't it, David? It's how long can we deal with this internally and have we got specialists that we now call on and have that high-level summit and make this big discussion? Yeah, 100%. There's no bulletproof answer when you're at the point of the coalface trying to work out do we pay the ransom or not. But if you know where to get some of these answers, particularly, as you said, bring in the specialists, don't rely internally. What is the impact to our systems? How long can we continue to limp along before it becomes critical? And what does criticality look like for us? And what's the cost of all of those things versus paying the ransom if we've decided that it's not an ethical decision? And I've seen boards backflip from being a very stern, we will not pay to we, and particularly with healthcare, we're now in a position where if we don't pay and it's an ethical decision we made, we're putting our patients at risk. And obviously patient duty of care has to come first. David, in a nutshell, what this means is we fundamentally need to understand what is our break-even point, what is our opportunity cost around this. It's one of the scenarios that we now need to bring into our risk management. And we need to also know who do we who is the triple O related to cyber. You know, 100%. It's, not, it's not the top medical expert, it's the top different expert. Yeah, and 100%. Something, yes. And I think the biggest problem for most businesses, particularly at the SMB and SME level, is they're not going to have an instant response firm on retainer. It's just too expensive. And so we often find at the point that this all occurs, they jump on Google looking for someone and quite often end up with someone who really isn't qualified, mm. which is why. Cyber insurance, even owned by cyber insurance, I'm not promoting it as such, but cyber insurance brings in an incident response retainer and gets you access to experts, which is which is it. which in the long run could save you. It may not save you costs, but it may save you reputation. It may help with your culture and core business disruption. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. David, Mike Tyson once said, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> when I've we heard that before and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> when, in your experience, 
the proportion of clients that you have helped and assisted, the ones that were prepared, that did the scenario planning, were organized and experienced an attack, how did that pan out uh, just as a proportion or did they have to make put themselves into twists and contortions and really throw the plan in the bin in order to, because they realised their priorities shifted under the heat of a cyber attack? Yeah, that's a really good question. In, in the vast majority of cases, businesses who have at least attempted to scope this out and have run through scenarios to practice it generally fare a lot better than businesses that have no idea. On the flip side, and this is where you need to bring in experts and run through scenarios, no one has enough experience other than people in my field of dealing with this every day. So they're not going to get everything right. But if you have a plan that allows you to at least know who to call, how to stand up a crisis management team, who's calling the shots, which is when do we raise things with the board? That's a big difference than freaking out, not knowing what to do and just in panic mode, which is not what we want people to be in, but most people haven't experienced a cyber incident. So that that's the state they end up in. And when you get to those scenarios where the gates of Newcastle grammar are locked and kids can't come to school or elective surgery has to be canceled, that really ramps up the pressure because core business is under threat. And once again, it goes back to that timeline. How long can you last? Yeah. And so would you expect that the ones that have planned, there's never going to be a perfect solution, manage to resolve faster than an organisation that hasn't at least tried to scenario plan? Yeah, yeah. Every time, particularly because most good incident response plans will also talk about who's in control, how to prioritise, those sort of things. If you end up with a too many cooks situation, it takes forever. So definitely planning in advance and running through that scenario makes a world of difference. That is a beautiful segue into incident response plans. We are going to experiment doing a poll today. We've got Ben in the background, pushing the buttons. We'd really love your feedback, everyone out there today. And to launch the poll, Ben, if you could just launch that for us. The question we pose to everyone today is, do you have an incident response plan? Now, you're either yes or no, or maybe you're not even sure. We would love to just take the next 30 to 40 seconds for you to all put in what you think as a director, as an executive, as a chair, do you have an incident response plan? And the numbers are flying in right now. Thank you for your participation. It's a really interesting question that posed, and I'm always interested to see the outline. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to do anything about that. But it's kind of like workplace and health and safety, and we're talking about governance and risks and all those sort of things. It's a very similar thing that if you have a plan for if there is a fire, this is where people meet. It makes life a lot easier. Yeah. Well, by the looks of it. Oh, no, there's about 50 responses. We'll give it another 20 seconds just to get that data. But nearly just under half the audience so far, David, do have an incident response plan. So that's encouraging. That's really good. Quite often when, and I was saying this before the call, when we do this sort of survey in some of our presentations and quite often they're at cybersecurity conferences, we'd probably be lucky to get 60% of the room. Now, that number is increasing over time as it's becoming more required by various regulations. But the second question I always am interested to know, and I don't think we have time for it today, is when was the last time it was read and played through and when was the last time it was revised? Because things change. Maybe while we get going, Ben, you might be able to try and with some technical magic in the background and we might just pose that towards the end of today's session. But if everyone can see the data, I'm not sure if they can, out of 64 people, 51 responded, 45% do have an incident response plan. So that's really good. 45 obviously don't or are not sure. 30% are not sure. We're in the business in governance of asking informed questions. I think at the next board meeting, if you're not sure, that's an incredibly strong informed question. Do we have an incident response plan? Mm. You don't have to be technical in relation to cyber and IT. That's not your role. 
as a director is to ask those informed questions because it's critical. So thank you for your participation in that. See how you go, Ben. Let us know as we get close towards the end. We'll shift. We'll shift along now, David, and we're going to get to the really exciting bit. This is what I've been waiting for two months, really, is what to do when you're under a cyber attack. No one talks about this. Not in the circles I hang around in anyway, that's for sure. So, uh, which, you're in the wrong circles, mate. Yeah, yeah. clearly. clearly hey. Hi, Ellie, I've got to get a new room. All right. <laughs> I'm going to throw it over to you now because we're really starting to get into the weeds. Yeah, for sure. And just to pose for everyone's benefit, the way in which we see most cyber incidents unveil is that it starts off as a computer problem, right? Someone comes into the office or someone dials into the system and it's not working or what they're looking for isn't there. And typically at this point, the user will log a request with the help desk, the help desk dials in to try and help. And it's at that point that we realize crap, we've had a cyber incident. In a best case scenario, the client will then call their insurance broker. The insurance broker lodges a claim with their cyber insurer and the insurer will respond and assign an incident response team. And that's when the IR team tends to reach out and things either go really well or not so well as the case often happens. And if you go to the next slide, please, Wes. How do you say that? Here it is. When things it's almost like we knew it was going to happen. So yeah. what we unfortunately see quite often for businesses is that the IR team reaches out, my team, in a lot of these examples. And one of the things we want to know is, can you please give us a list of all your IT systems? And what we're talking about there is, what servers do you have? What databases do you have? Give us a map of your environment so that we know how to navigate it when we're doing our process. And we find that the business either doesn't have one or the way in which that asset list was stored has now been encrypted by the ransomware. So it's unavailable, which makes our job really hard. There are ways for us to work around that, but it slows us down. The next thing, when it comes to forensics and trying to understand what the threat actor has done, Unfortunately, we often find that the logging data, the records of every activity that have happened just either doesn't exist or wasn't configured in a way that's going to give us enough time. And that's pretty standard that they're default. So it's not exactly like someone's done the wrong thing. That's just they haven't been proactive in it. And then we unfortunately discover that the threat actor has actually been in the environment for a while. And the worst part about it, and this is where we're, we're not trying to rag on on the IT team, but the IT team in doing their own investigation quite often stood all over the crime scene. They've damaged some of the data that we would be able to use to be able to paint a picture of what the threat actor has done. If we go to the next slide, I think we have the outcome of, of this sad story. What that means for a lot of businesses is that we don't have enough forensically relevant data to disprove that data exfiltration or unauthorized access has happened. That then means that we may have to notify because if we can't prove they haven't accessed it. There's this area of, of concern. Um, and also the threat actor will quite often, back to the ransomware double extortion thing, will claim that they've actually exfiltrated. So they've copied hundreds of gigs worth of their client data and are threatening to publish it. And this is not the situation we want our, our, our businesses to end up in. And for no fault of their own, because we don't have cyber, businesses aren't experienced with having cyber incidents every day, this is unfortunately the sort of situation we end up in. And David, is it common or possible that they're actually bluffing, that they haven't exfilled at all? Yeah, th th there's a couple of ransomware groups that do it on the basis that they hope, but in the background, we have fairly good threat intelligence. We work with a lot of law enforcement, private public sectors as well. And we can identify the group usually by what type of ransomware they used. And we know what they're like as a standard operation and whether it is more likely that they do or don't. So we can usually steer that, that discussion. But if you've got no data to disprove it and it's a threat actor group that commonly does exfiltrate data, you've got to make that decision. Fair enough. 
In the background, Ben has weaved his technical magic and managed to put another poll together for the question for the people who do have an incident response plan. Has your incident response plan been reviewed in the last 12 months? If you could launch that now, Ben, and the people that have responded with that, could you just help us out? Yes, no, not sure. And the numbers are coming in really good. This is fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. This is really cool. In the last 12 months. So that's the critical question. And there's no. And yes, they're clear answers, but they're not sure. I'm always intrigued by that. And that's something that could be tabled at least at a risk subcommittee fee or uh, certainly board level. And it looks like just about there, 38 responses. Okay, so the results are in. 45% have reviewed it in the last 12 months. 29% have not. And 26% are not sure. So there's a big opportunity there for 55% of the audience that have an incident response plan to maybe take another look or open the discussion at least certainly at a, a subcommittee level of risk and certainly perhaps even tabling it at board level. We'll move on to the really fun bit, the workflows before we talk about negotiating with cyber criminals. This is what a typical workflow looks like when you're, you step into the picture. David, is that correct? Yeah. This is based off the standard incident response framework plus I've added in some stuff about what kicks off at the end of it generally speaking we identify identification that there's been an incident our first goal is what we consider containment and eradication so we want to stop the bleeding so to speak and we want to evict the threat actor from the environment and I've got a case study later where we'll talk about what happens when that goes wrong once we've contained the environment and eradicated the threat actor from it, we can now kick off business resumption, which is basically getting that business back up and running. Again, talking about incident response plans and all the rest of it, we will focus on the business systems that are most critical to that business. Our goal is to get the business back up and running. Might not be 100%, but we want them to be able to operate as we're talking about opening gates or issuing scripts, all that sort of stuff. What is it that we need to do to get to that 70, 80% operational. And then once the pressure's off and the business can operate, there's a reduction in what we call business interruption costs. Other things can be brought online in a more reasonable timeline. In the background, forensic analysis and what we call root cause analysis will happen. These things can run in parallel. You don't have to finish containment eradication before forensic starts. But you generally want to make sure that you, in containment and eradication and business resumption, you're not destroying forensic evidence. So we try and capture the data and have a team that runs that as well. I had a pop-up. Now, out of the forensic analysis, one of the things we're trying to understand is what do the threat actor do while they're in the environment? And particularly with aged care, healthcare, and all these sort of medical-based institutes, we're really trying to understand, has the threat actor access sensitive customer information and as a byproduct, have we triggered a requirement under the Privacy Act or other regulatory advice? If that happens, we will bring in legal partners. We always aim for legal partners who do this sort of thing all day, every day. There's some really good examples out there of PR and regulatory advice that's gone really well. And there's also some really bad examples where law firms who are probably very amazing established law firms, but they don't do this every day have gone out with what they thought was good comms and it hasn't landed well and it's ended up in the media and, and turned into a bit of a, a nightmare. The biggest problem that happens at the end, though, is notification. And the reason it's a problem is most businesses just don't have any idea of the sort of data they store. And this is a governance problem in itself. Under the Privacy Act, there's certain requirements for storing data for a certain period. Obviously, medical has its own, legal has its own outside of that, but a lot of businesses collect more data than they need to collect. A lot of businesses keep the data longer than they need to collect. And then they're then in this position where they have to go tell all their customers, um, this is what we think you, may have been stored on you. 
we built a notification system that uses machine learning and funky stuff to to analyze large sets of data and find things like passports and scan driver's licenses in the middle of other data sets so that we could give an informed notification. I very much believe that blanket notifications where you just tell people, look, you could have been part of the data breach and it might have been your credit card, it might have been your passport, just causes stress and no one wants that. Any incident that's followed that approach has generally fared very negatively in the media. Our belief is if you can give them a very informed approach, then they know what to look for. Do they need to replace driver's licenses? Do we need to look at credit monitoring? It's a much more controlled and less stress environment. But those last two sections, the legal advice and notification is where a lot of the cost goes into it. A lot of the time goes into it. It's not something that just happens overnight. And a lot of boards will be stressing, wanting out- outputs. Tell me when's this going to happen? Can you give us updates? Can you give us updates? And it can take a couple of weeks, a couple of months to get to that position. And when you've got the stakeholders of the board and customers you're trying to deal with, if you don't have the right people in the right seats, that can go very badly. And David, this there is an overlap with a legal obligation with the Privacy Act, but when you have to actually go out to the market and notify your customers, and even worse, like the case of Optus, where they had customer data going back years and years, they weren't actually customers, because I was one of them, They've been hanging on to data. For, I think the legal requirement is only up to about six months, but we've got systems here that are failing. They're holding data from five, 10 years, a clear failing. And that's just going to hurt. It goes back to those points that Fee made earlier on those governance issues. You've got that financial cost of the cleanup. We know that, was it Optus or Medibank? I can't remember. They have to go and pay for the reissuances of passports and driver's license. Then you've got the legal awesome. thing. Then you've got the reputational brand. Then you've got the market share loss and the loss of trust. This is cascading so far outside of IT it could literally be the end of your business, whether it's immediate, they switch everything off, or you're on the road on that slippery slope downwards. Yeah. That this workflow is, that's when stuff gets real. Yeah. And the Optus example is a good one. We've seen there are reports that they lost at least 10% of their customer base after. As you said, I think the last quote I saw for replacement of identity documents was anything between $20 per driver's license to something like $50 per driver's license. So these costs add up really quickly. And then you have, and we're starting to see it, unfortunately, more so in Australia, we're becoming more litigious. You're seeing class action lawsuits chasing down these things. The potential risks to the business and the more that you were doing what you shouldn't have been doing, like storing data you didn't need to store for a period you wouldn't, the more likely you're going to be hit with the the, the fines and all these other costs that most businesses had no consideration was even a a risk. Absolutely. Just to finish off on that point, I ran the numbers on the class action lawsuit for Medibank and Optus, and they're calculating $20,000 per customer. So so when you overlay that with 9.6 million past or present customers, that that could wipe out your balance sheet. But even for small, there's sort of, a lot of the clients I'm sure on the call aren't that size and probably don't have that many records. But even when we're talking 10,000 to maybe 100,000 customer records over a life cycle of a business, that's still a huge amount of money. Absolutely. Protect the balance sheet. So this is my favourite part of today. This is what I've been waiting for, David. This is the bit that got you excited. This has got me excited. I've been waiting three months for this moment. I don't know anyone who has negotiated with a cyber criminal. I'm not sure anyone in the audience has. They may have. I'm not sure. But let's assume no one's ever done it. So let's talk about it and what it looks like because stuff gets real when you're in the frying pan during that. And we need clear heads, wise heads, and heads that have rehearsed through the incident response plans. Yeah. And it's a really interesting thing. It's actually something that my team and I love doing, ironically. (laughs) the problem we often see is the it team or the client will try and reach out to the threat actor themselves and in doing that you can kick off a timer and the timer when it runs out they might start charging you double or they might revoke the option of 
of paying the ransom. So if you don't know what you're doing, it, it can cause some serious harm or additional costs to the business. The thing with dealing with ransomware groups, you've got to understand that they're actually a business, even though they're a very unethical business. The people who we are communicating are often customer service reps. They turn up every day, they respond to emails they and they negotiate. It just so happens they're taking money away from us, but from their perspective, they're just earning a living. And so there's been many a negotiation I've had where you won't hear from them for a few days because they're on leave or they have to go and ask their supervisor whether or not the deal you're trying to put on the table is something that they're willing to approve. So there's all of these things in the background that if you haven't got your head around that fact, you're just thinking that it's some hacker in a room somewhere and wondering why they're not responding. It can be really quite frustrating. So the things that boards probably need to take into consideration here when they're evaluating paying the ransom is timelines and business resumption is obviously the most important thing we worry about. If all you care about is paying the ransom and getting the business back up and running, that can take a couple of days. If you want to stall the cyber criminals, maybe you're trying to work out whether or not your business resumption strategy will work, your business continuity plan will work. Maybe you're trying to work out whether or not the data has been leaked or you want to stall that data from being leaked on the dark web, or you want to negotiate the price down. And you can negotiate like a house on these things. You don't have to accept the first offer. You, you can generally do that for a number of weeks. However, there does become a point in the exercise, again, negotiating a house where the vendor, the cyber criminal, will, will lose patience. And I've seen instances where it's been dragged out so long that the cyber criminal will stop negotiation entirely and just dump the data and i've seen others where they they start getting quite aggressive because they want an outcome but every threat actor group is different and you need to learn how their processes work to know how to best negotiate that that deal david do you ever get a sense with your vast experience how large these organizations are like in terms of headcount or anything because i think it's really important that point that we're not talking about a 14 year old genius in the basement of his mum's house or garage just trying to show how clever they are and make some really good money that to that point that this is organized crime that these are organizations with a bureaucracy yeah that, you know, can you give us a sense of that yeah, every group's different, but you typically find that it's anything from maybe half a dozen people in a particular team up to 20 or 30 people in a particular team. And coming back to the point about ransomware, there's also segments and there's specialists. There's also with ransomware as well, like one group could perhaps write the ransomware code and the platform that allows them to do all their dealings someone else can sub-license access to that ransomware and go off and use it. So it, there's, it's almost like a multi-level marketing system where you've got different tiers and different people and different specialities, but they're all working in conjunction with each other for a payday. Yeah. Wow. I, if that doesn't illustrate the gravity and the seriousness, but I'm not really sure what is that this is organized crime and there's specialization in those sub-segments of this organized crime. Now you've finalized a way out, a number. The board's decided we're going to pay because we cannot afford that. We're getting two minutes to midnight, business disruptions too critical. We're going to lose our reputation, our stakes, our stakeholder engagement, everything. What happens when you go, all right, we're going to pay up? Yeah. And this is again, it's another thing usually when we're doing sort of crisis simulations and stepping boards through that they hadn't considered again because they've not had to deal with this one of the first things is with after the invasion in ukraine we have a lot of entities that are sanctioned and you've got to be really careful that you don't inadvertently pay a sanctioned entity and you can't identify whether or not that entity is sanctioned until we get what's called the bitcoin wallet so basically the bank account details the electronic bank account details we're going to pay into if all of that passes and I've not yet seen a risk of paying a sanctioned entity, 
thankfully, in, in all the negotiations we've done. But you've got to understand that you have to pay the money up front. If you have cyber insurance, they won't pay the ransom, but you'll have to pay if it's half a million bucks, whatever, into, into someone's wallet. Usually ransomware negotiation firms and what have you will allow you to transfer money into their account. They will then transfer it into Bitcoin. Once you send the Bitcoin to the threat actors, it takes about six to 12 hours, kind of like a direct transfer from banks for it to process. The blockchain takes about that long to update and the threat actor will wait until the blockchain is updated to a certain point before they will confirm that the transfer has completed because in years gone by, we used to wait till it had updated a certain amount and then we'd re we'd retract it. And we knew the threat actor would pay it, give us the decryptor, and then we could return the money. But they obviously got wise to that. They're an evolving business and they don't allow that anymore. Next, so we pay the money. The threat actor has acknowledged receivement of those funds. There can be a delay between getting the decryptor. I have found a couple of days waiting for decryptor. I've found that the initial decryptor they've given us didn't work. And I've got to go back to them almost like an IT support help desk for help on using their decryptor for their files. Or I've found that the decryptor they've given us is really slow. We've gone from maybe it's a couple of days worth of negotiation and we've a couple of days worth of time to pay and get the decryptor. And now we're looking at weeks to decrypt the data just because of how poorly written this thing is. In almost all cases, the systems will not come back online perfectly. There's always going to be need to be some level of repair. You don't have to burn them to the ground, restart everything from scratch. I've seen a lot of IT guys race to do that. If containment and eradication is done properly, that's not necessary, but there's still a chance that some parts of your systems will need repair. Some of them may need to be reloaded. And we often find, unfortunately, a lot of the ransomware is written in a way that things like large database files, just when they're encrypted, that they corrupt. And so even when they decrypt, there's no recovery of them. And this means that we've often seen the full system recovery take weeks or months to do after the business has made that decision to, to pay a ransom. That needs to feed into that previous discussion of, are we going to pay it? You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't because if you do pay all of a sudden you could still be down for weeks and all of a sudden business disruption once again can it handle or absorb that level of disruption or is it just a proportionate part half your business is down not all of it david i just wanted to talk to the blockchain little piece there on sanctions because it really got me curious there is it a case of if someone has a blockchain account they're stepping outside, they're not sanctioned, that they're legitimate, because that's how I interpreted that answer. No. So we can, the systems out there, like there's a pro, there's a system called chain analysis and a few other things. But the previous understanding everyone had was that Bitcoin was anonymous. That's not true. And in fact, we're actually starting to see in the media a number of older criminal activities being uncovered and people being arrested because we are able to do analysis of the blockchain and identify where the money went and who it went to and everything else. So you and I can have block Bitcoin wallet addresses and that's legal. What we actually have to do is an analyze where that fund goes to, where it's withdrawn, what exchanges, what tumblers, et cetera, goes through, and then attribute that to criminal organizations. And sometimes retroactively, it'll come back later and say, well, actually, that is Revil or uh, or Clop or one of these other ransomware groups. And it's like you and I having a bank account. We might be good people, but there could also be some people with bank accounts who are not so good. Absolutely. Gina Tresseter is just dropped in a question in the chat have you ever paid a ransom and the criminal did not decrypt the data yeah really good question i personally have never negotiated a ransomware incident where we did not get the client's data back however mm -hmm. i have had an incident where unfortunately the managed service provider the it provider would not let us 
step in and do the negotiation. And they insisted, and I think it's ego and not wanting to look like they messed up. They persisted on doing the negotiations. They didn't understand how these groups work. They, the group didn't respond to them for a couple of days and they harassed the crap out of them because the client had paid $8,000. It was a small ransom at that point in time. Um, but basically the, the ransomware group turned around and told them to pound sand because they didn't appreciate being harassed and the client never got their data back. It's the only one I was working with that didn't work out, but it is the risk of the wrong people trying to do the right thing, causing trouble. For sure. And just to that point, Craig, Gillis also said all training I've received says not to pay the ransom. That's safe track training. I think what we've learned here today that no situations, it's not uniform. Every situation's different and every organization's different. There's not one blanket solution. I think, would you agree with that assertion? Yeah. Governments are constantly discussing trying to ban ransomware payments with the belief that if we stop ransomware payments, we'll stop cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. And that's speculative. The bottom line, if your business is affected and not paying the ransom would mean that your business would go under or your customers, patients, et cetera, would be negatively impacted or potentially hurt as a byproduct, you're not going to... um, you're going to do what's right for your business and your customers and make that make that decision. Yeah, absolutely. Faye, I'm going to bring you into the conversation right now because this is a slide that we spoke about last month. I think it's really important just to demonstrate what we can do. We've got a lot of not-for-profits on the call today. Some are large organizations, but some are really small as well. And from a government, and they don't always have the luxury of experts like David on retainer and all those sorts of things. But we did speak about the low-hanging fruit last month. And to this point, these are some of the things we could do to start really getting that conversation about the models that you could implement right now. Let's quickly run through this list again. Yes, Wes, the key role of the board is to understand what top risks are and bring them into the conversation. So adding cyber as a permanent agenda item is incredibly important so that a curious board can become informed. And one of the best ways to do that is to actually make sure that it is part of the risk committee. It's Yes, it will be on our risk register, But it is actually something that our risk committee does actually look into and bring scenarios and information to the board. And as I said before, if you make it a standing board agenda item, then it is discussed. And it's that anything, any questions that the board asks creates activity within an organisation. And it is that activity that creates the culture. And David, I think you'd agree that you can't be expecting the directors to be governance cyber security experts, but we expect them to be really curious and ask questions. And the committees as well mean that connection with the executive and the staff asking the questions at that level. And David, we've even have examples of organisations that have designated cyber committees when they've decided that this is a big enough risk to have a cyber committee. And that's where they bring that expert in. Brilliant. I'm just mindful of time and I'm really excited about the amount of questions coming in right now. Yes. They look out. good, Wes. They look great. And a lot of them have got a, a legal nature about them, but I do... Mm-hmm. We will get to that, but I do want to get to the juicy bit coming up right now, which is some of these case studies. What has really happened, where it's worked well, where it's worked bad, even if there's ugly scenarios. I'm not sure if we really scoped that one, David, but certainly I know you've got two case studies in mind 
from your experience, what does that look like? And what's good look like? What's bad look like? Yeah, great question. I think also in the interest of time, I'll do the good and the bad. And if anyone wants to know ugly, they can reach out. But uh, a really good example, and we alluded to it, and I think I mentioned it before, was it was an aged care facility. They got ransomware, as we discussed, couldn't access their residence information, which also meant that they were unable to issue scripts for the custom for their patients. And they had a timeline. Yeah, you know, they had a couple of days before they knew that they were going to be in a really precarious situation. They were very tempted to send their servers to there's quite a few places that advertise that they can decrypt ransomware. If anyone ever considers that, we're fairly sure those places are probably just paying the ransom anywhere, but I have no proof, but it seems very dodgy since most of the ransomware is military grade encryption and you've got very little chance of decrypting it with any tools. We were actually able to negotiate with the ransomware. We got their data back. We were able to get their systems back up and running. But unfortunately, in the way it happened and the way their backups were stored, we had no way of identifying forensically whether or not there was any unauthorized access. And so we had to notify because there was a lot of sensitive resident information. On the bad example, however, so that, that is a good example. It doesn't sound it, but that is a good outcome. We had another healthcare provider who typically looked after low socioeconomic customers. They got ransomware. IR was engaged. The IT provider wanted to prove themselves. And so instead of giving us access so we could do the containment and eradication, they rolled back the entire environment from the backups, but then they got ransomed again. And so the IT provider rolled them back again. And they, the company then notified their clients without getting any details. And then they got ransomware again. And this time they finally gave us access and we were able to identify that the threat actor had managed to maintain persistence actually in one of the desktop computers. So none of the servers that were being restored. And so every time the IT provider restored things, they were just jumping over it and encrypting it again. We finally got to a point where we could evict the threat actor We did manage to restore the systems and no data was lost because the backups were good. But because of the backwards and forwards with the restoration, we had no forensic data. They were forced to notify. There was quite a long timeline between the initial incident when they notified clients with a blanket notification and when they finally got out to notify with a more informed one. As you can understand with that sort of cohort of clients, they're very at risk. There was a lot of complaints and we have a lot of lawyers who kind of chase that sort of stuff. We haven't seen it yet, but there is concerns that that's going to turn into a class action lawsuit as well. Wow. You heard it here first. Now, obviously talking about ugly, um, I think people in the audience might be able to reach out to you if they need to know more about that. And what we'll do, David, if it's okay with you, we do, as everyone knows, email a replay of a recording of this and the slides out and I'll put in your LinkedIn contact details and your web address details if people want to get in touch with David, certainly to scenario plan or if you're just nervous, if that's okay with you. Yeah, 100%. um, Do that. And now just want to, we're getting a lot of questions, especially about a legal flavour. Are there templates and policy responses available? To answer that, we do have some, in particular to your question, Justin Croom, do you have an incident response plan? We do know that 45% of the audience do, and probably 30% of the remaining 55 are not sure. So what we're going to be doing next week is the, the legal personal liability implications for a cyber attack. If you're an organisation that has a proven track record of not taking it seriously at a board level. What is your personal responsibility, your personal liability as a director to a catastrophic attack? And so we've been very, very fortunate to get the help of cybersecurity legal experts from Mills Oakley lawyer lawyers. Ben, if you can just drop the webinar link in the chat, 
It will be for next Thursday. It is what we call an insight session. Slightly different to our webinars where there's a few questions and we're a little bit more of a broadcast. This is a QA. and a We will guide it, but the insight session will be guided by the attendees. And what we'll be supplying as a part of that is an incident response plan. So for people who do attend, they can pick the brains of the lawyers. We've got one from Sydney from the Mills Oakley office there and Jonathan Green as well from the Melbourne office. That's what they specialise in. And Jonathan in particular specialises in the not-for-profit sector. So we're really fortunate to get legal expertise in cyber and not-for-profit on that call. That's going to be at 2 p.m. next Thursday. And I will stress, it will not be recorded. There will be no replays and it's only attendees will be able to experience that, but also pick up the incident response plans, the templates, they're very variable. We've seen the need for it because if anything I've learned today, David, it really boils down to time, how much time you've got to be disrupted, whether you're going to be in business after that, that, uh, midnight strike of the clock, so to speak. Is there a good way to check the standard of incidents response plans? We'll be talking about that. David, do you actually have any insights into that? The quality of an incident? That's a really good question from Maria Fusch. We will touch on that. Are there varying degrees of quality of incident response plans? Yeah, yeah there, there are. It's kind of like, I go back to the workplace health and safety sort of plan. Yeah. It's not meant to be all encompassing. It's just meant to give you a guide. Uh, the best way you can test your IRP incident response plan is to run a simulation. And so there's thing we call them a tabletop exercise. And you know we run them for crisis management teams. We run them for boards. They're slightly different depending on on, on the focus group. But that gives you an opportunity to run through a scenario mm -hmm. and look at your playbooks, your incident response plan, crisis management team plans, all those sort of things, and understand if there's any gaps. Uh, and I would recommend that businesses do go through that process, but kind of like we talked about the roadmap the last time, don't start off there. You, you need to build up your maturity to a certain point because you'll go in and find gaps. But it, it, you do them, depending on the business, once a year, every couple of years, whatever, as a way of testing it and getting people familiar and it's a really good way, kind of like we do a fire drill of the office so everyone knows where the, the safety points are and, and the exit strategy. Same with cyber. That's amazing. Look, Ben, we've, to everyone out there, the link is in the chat if you can find it. Just give me a thumbs up, everyone out there, if they cannot see it or can see it, just so we know we've got it out there. That link will also be in the uh, in the uh, replay sending out Elizabeth Harris, put a hand up. I've got to find that. That's fantastic. But like I said, this is the real pointy bit. There's, I know in corporate, there's directors liability insurance for catastrophic events and what you could be personally liable. We need to unpack the question and we will be talking about the Privacy Act next Thursday with our experts. We did touch on it today. So if you're not sure about your fiduciary duty and your duty of care, now that is the time to start asking those questions because we will stay on that insight session until every question is answered. It's going to go as long as it needs to make sure everyone's satisfied that they've got the answers, whether it's from a legal point of view or from a governance point of view. We're here to help you because this is important that we do this. And so it looks like, yeah, Michael, Neil, they've seen the link. I really hope to see both of you on that chat, we consider it a fireside chat rather than a broadcast webinar. I think, Fee, we've come to the end of our cyber series. It's been three months in the making and it couldn't have happened without David Ruddick from Solus. And we want to make sure that everyone is really clear where to turn to when things go bad. They will go bad. You will get an incident. That, that's it. We know that's going to happen. So we'll put his contact details in the replay. David, I just want to say thank you. you no, you've, you've pleasure. Brought so much to the table for not only today, but last month as well, and really educated myself personally. I know Fee, yeah, 
we've had our minds exploded by what the reality looks like out there. And and also to Michael Perrant from Aon, three, two months ago, he really unpacked from an insurer's point of view and Aon, those not-for-profit sectors are getting targeted. He showed the data breakdown of the categories and most people on this call, you are sitting in those high priority categories. So it's not a matter of if, it's when and how much and how many times. So I, I really hope everyone's got a lot out of this. We will be following up with a replay, but we'd really love to see you on our insight session next Thursday, 6th of July at 2 p.m., where you can ask the lawyers the hard questions. And like lawyers, I'm sure they'll give you really clear, hard answers. And uh, and we look forward to such an esteemed cohort from Mills Oakley. Without further ado, I think we'll wrap it up, Fee. I'd really like to thank the audience for their participation today. Any final words, Fee? No, I just want to thank you, Wes, for putting this whole program together. It has been sensational. And David, what you've brought to the table and shared with us has turned it from being a risk that we've identified at Govern With because of individual director capabilities and executive capabilities and from a governance management of risk perspective, you've actually turned it into a, so how on earth do we address it? Mm -hmm. So often all we hear about at governance is theory and this is a risk and everyone's sitting around going, oh my goodness, how on earth do we address it? You've actually given us some significant insight into what really happens and some fabulous how-tos. And I cannot thank you enough. And I do really encourage people to reach out and talk to you because I think it makes a difference. I personally think from a governance perspective, the secret is to know what are the top risks and who are the experts that can help us manage it. So thank you. No, absolutely my pleasure to both of you. I've, I've, I have a lot of fun with this. I love, I love scaring people a little bit, but that's only to try and open their eyes and hopefully translate it into a language that they get. I don't expect them to know what I know, just enough that they can make informed decisions. Absolutely. I, you've certainly de delivered in spades there, David. So thank you so much to everyone out there, to the 55% of audiences out there who either don't have an incident response plan or don't know, come along to the insight session where attendees will get their own incident response plan. And maybe that's the opportunity to open up the discussion at the board table if it's not there already. And like we said, the data shows that our Australian director's capability to ask informed questions is in the bottom quartile. So we need to change that. And this is the, the process of doing that. So without further ado, we'll wrap this up. We really appreciate your time. We have gone eight minutes over, so we're respectful of that too. I look forward to seeing you all on the Insight Session next Thursday at 2 p.m.